So I'm reviewing, uh, I'm playing back the videos I'm about to post. And I've noticed that uh, not only did I forget wh whose name was supposed to be capitalized in the first relational algebra lecture, in the second one, while trying to excuse that one, I think I said something like abelian field, even though the term is abelian group. And so the, some, some part of the, the mathematician inside me died a little bit. Uh, so whatever. It's a good thing I don't need much mathematician cred to teach a course like this. So it turns out that we actually have, as far as like the, the push towards exam three and its material, we have one sequence left. And this is, formally, this would constitute uh, about three in-person lectures worth of material. Uh, I think last time I taught the course, this, this sort of sequence here. And the goal um, leading up and just, just a little bit passing the, the material for exam three is to explore all the ways we can use the basic SQL and relational algebra operations up to and including joins, natural joins and aggregation uh, to, like, to do legitimate work. After exam three, we're going to talk about advanced SQL, which will be things like the other kinds of joins, uh, what's, what are called window functions, um, and uh, the ability to have null values and, and so on. Uh, so uh, one thing that would be helpful as you watch this, because this is the analog of sort of live coding, so it takes three lectures to do this in person, but it'll probably take less than that to do it on a video because we'll, we'll uh, hold back some of the stuff to talk about for some of our live tutorial stuff. Um, what would be helpful is because this is sort of writing code in front of an audience of nobody, uh, if, any, if anybody has any feedback of ways this, this actually is, uh, might be helpful, let me know because I have to do this in the fall for 400 students and it would be nice to know what's going on. I, I've made a couple of improvements since the last video I recorded. Um, one of them is I, I noticed that I scrolled up and down a bit too much in the, at near the end of that last one where I was writing long queries. I'll try and avoid that today. Uh, it's sort of weird to, just like with the abelian group problem, to not have an audience of people that can sort of holler at me when I'm doing something stupid, um, to have to catch my own errors, maybe catch them in post-production. So I'm going to run through these queries. This isn't just practice, though. The, the goal of this type of sequence isn't just to practice writing queries. New stuff is being introduced as I go through this. It's a lot of reinforcement, but it's a lot of um, learning how to structure queries effectively. And so I'm actually, there will be some new topics that get introduced in this sequence in various places. The first thing I'm going to do is scroll my query so that it's just barely occupying the whole screen. So what I want is the customer name and order number of every order that um, meets one or more of these two criteria. And you might notice the criteria have been chosen to be essentially completely independent. An order can contain raspberries or not. It can have three items or not, or both. There's no obvious link between them. What's interesting is this usually doesn't catch people off guard. They, they immediately, um, once they're used to this kind of query, they see right through it. They say, what I need here is probably a union. If it's anything that obeys one or both of these two criteria, it looks like I need a union. What's weird is if there was something uh, related about these two subconditions, so contain raspberries or contain both pears and apples or something, they may not notice that a union would do the trick much easier than um, having to write some complicated aggregation-based thing. So that's the first thing to observe. The second thing, which I touched on at the end of the series of relational algebra examples, is that uh, we do not want to write this as one massive query. We would rather break it up into pieces. Uh, so here's the way I'm going to interpret this. Um, I'm going to find all orders that contain raspberries. And then I'm going to separately find all orders uh, that contain at, um, three or more items. And then I take the union of the above two. Um, and then I join it back. So if I'm working with orders, I should be thinking only of order numbers. Uh, if I ever need anything else, like the customer name, I should take the result uh, after I've done all the work I need to on my order numbers, join the result to the orders table. Uh, to compute um, the customer name for each order, uh, and then um, sort the rows. So this ordering the rows is one thing we are officially going to see for the very first time in this example. And it is a directive called order by. Uh, I've posted a set of notes on the uh, different clauses of SQL select statements, and you can take a look at them. They're the kind of notes that, uh, and for this part of the course, we're not going to see slides for quite a while. We're going to mostly see live 
examples like this and type notes. Um, the notes contain some stuff that doesn't make a very good lecture, like a list of the order of execution of our clauses. Um, and so you should take a look at that because in, because of SQL clauses, SQL statements being so expansive, it's good to know the order things get executed. So we, we can actually do each of these things individually. So, okay, select all order numbers that contain raspberries. Well, if I wanted to select them uniquely, I would say select distinct. We'll, we'll eventually get used to not doing that because it turns out if we're folding it into a union eventually, that'll take care of eliminating duplicates uh, for us. And I guess I should recommend, just like before I forgot to do this, pull up on the side those slides about SQL and relational algebra so that you can have the, the schema of this database up um, next to you. We won't have that luxury for long. Once we begin working in the lectures with other databases, we're going to have to just think about them as opposed to knowing what the data looks like. So I'm going to find all orders that contain raspberries. I only need the order contents table for that. Uh, and I just, and then, well, actually, sorry, I guess I need to know which, where I got raspberries from. So I have to natural join order contents to products um, where the name equals raspberry. And we'll try running that. Order 1002, order 1003, that looks good. Can I find all orders that contain three or more items? Okay, well, that's a little bit different. So in this case, I do not need the, um, uh, the, uh, products table because all I need to do is look at the contents of each order. So I take a look at order contents. Uh, I need to see, I want to know how many rows go with each order. I want to count the number of rows for each order number in this table. So maybe it should be clear that what I need to do involves more than one row of the table at a time and therefore what I want is aggregation. So I'm going to group by order number and what I want to do is keep only, we'll just take a look at what uh, happens here. This gives me uh, each bucket. It gives me, it makes one bucket per order number because it's grouping by that and then it prints out the buckets that I have. If I use this, the count aggregation function, um, I'm going to count the product IDs that I see. Um, if I use this, I can see how many products the order contains. I don't actually care how many products the order contains. I want to keep all the, all the order numbers that have at least three. I don't actually care if it's four or seven or three or whatever. So what I want is either to take this entire thing and then search it using a where clause, out, using a nested query in a where clause, search it for the cases where count is greater than three, or I think this is a great opportunity to demonstrate the having clause. I want to keep all the rows having the number of product uh, IDs per order greater than or equal to three. And we'll see it's order 1001, which has three orders, uh, three products, and order 1003, which also does. So remember that the having clause executes after grouping, whereas the where clause executes before grouping. So you can't put the count aggregation function in the where clause because you haven't grouped anything yet. Um, so your options are either to put a where clause outside the query or to um, uh, use the having clause. And as I said in the lecture about this, the having clause is a bit quaint, but you get used to it over time. So we notice if I want to take the, the next two steps are take the union of these things and then join it. And if I, I could make one massive query full of uh, layers and layers of nested queries that did this. But that's not the way I think, and it also would be a real mess to indent and to debug. Which part goes with which operation? And so I foreshadowed this at the end of the last video, um, and you saw me for a few seconds of dead air fighting with debugging, uh, doing this in reverse. So we should be proactive here. What I want to do is I have created, a, I have solved each subproblem, and I want to put these subproblems together. So I want to do the same thing I do in any other programming language and define variables to keep track of my intermediate results. And we can do that. We can define uh, a clause at the very beginning of our um, select statement called with. And the with clause lets us define um, sort of smaller temporary tables for each of my different uh, subqueries and then give it a name. So orders with raspberries as, and I already complained about this strange use of the word as, and I'm going to indent this again, and you'll notice that there is no semicolon at the end of these things, uh, because the semicolon is the end of the entire statement, and this is not a select statement, uh, a first order select statement by itself. It's actually part of a larger statement to come later. Uh, orders with at least three items as, um, I'm also fighting with the automatic indentation that uh, 
D Beaver likes to use. All right, so that's this. And we'll notice that uh, both of these subqueries, if I were, were to run them by themselves, only return order numbers. And that means if I take the union of them, it makes sense. I can't take the union of two things with a different number of columns, but I also shouldn't take the union of two things if the contents of those columns don't match up. Okay, so orders with either condition as, um, well, I'll select everything from the first thing, orders with raspberries, and I'll take the union of that with the result of grabbing everything from the other one. And I've mentioned already, I've, I keep complaining about this, the union operator compared to operators like natural join, it just, it, it goes in such a strange place. But it's good to learn how to use it because uh, in a case like this, the alternative is disgusting. Like not being able to use union here would make a real mess of this query. Okay. And then I've gotten down here. So I've got a whole bunch of these subqueries that I've encoded into um, this with clause. Formally, these are called common table expressions, CTEs. Uh, and now I have two things left on my shopping list. And I'm sorry about the scrolling. I don't know if I can do much about that. There's only so much space on my screen. Um, so these CTEs also have the advantage that subqueries, just nested queries, uh, don't have, that the database engine will compute this and usually cache it. So if you need it again, it doesn't go compute it again from scratch. If you use a subquery, the database engine could evaluate the subquery over and over again, which sometimes could be faster compared to caching it, but in many cases could be slower. And so we do actually optimize a little bit the way the query runs by doing it this way. Um, if you put a with statement, you separate the various uh, CTEs, the various pieces of it, with commas, as you can see here, but you do not put a comma after the last thing. After the very last one, you, the with statement, the with clause is over and you run the proper query, which can then use any of these things. So I'm going to begin by just as a debugging thing, I'm going to select um, everything from my last subquery. So I'm not done yet, but uh, I want to make sure that this actually works. So it does seem to work. I, uh, order 1002 does contain raspberries. Order 1000 doesn't. So I can validate this data by hand a little bit. I think I have all the orders that I need. Um, also, taking the union of the above two, I've already done that. Um, and now I have to somehow pull out the name of the customer from this. And so I, obviously this is just order numbers, but I can then take this and I can use a natural join to join it to my orders table. So we'll see what happens there. Okay, so now I get the customer name, the order number, uh, and the, well, both parts of the customer's name, first and last. And I have to scroll up to see this, but what was the actual prompt? Customer name and order number. I should interpret that as being in, uh, in that order. So customer, last name, customer, customer first name, and order num from that. So there it is. Uh, and I have one more thing I have to do, which is it says order the results in ascending order by the customer's last name. And this is one reason why you should take a look at um, the notes I posted about the order of the clauses in a select statement. Because this clause I'm going to add now is, the, is one of the very last things done. And as a result, uh, it's often sort of counterintuitive how it works if you combine it with operations like union that you expect to be done even later, which turn out not to be. And it's a clause called order by. So I order by, I give, a, I give one or more column names, and it then sorts them by those column names in that uh, resolving ties as it goes. So I could say order by customer last name, and then you can write ASC for ascending. So I'll try running that. Uh, I will press page up by accident. I will try running that. Um, and in this case, it sorts them into ascending order. I can also sort them into descending order. You might notice it looks like it actually already was sorted before I did that. If I ask you to sort it, you need to add an order by directive. You have no guarantee that the database will ever do the same thing twice. You don't know what it's doing internally to store its data. You don't know whether it's putting them in a specific order because of strange random factors or because it actually is ordering them. And so the only way to get an order you re can rely on is by asking for it explicitly. Now, suppose that two customers had the same last name. Maybe you'd want to also sort by first name to resolve the tie. And so what you'd do is you'd say customer last name, comma, customer first name. That only uses customer first name if, two, if the last names match. In this case, it only said last name, so I'm going to leave it like this. So that's the end of query one. Uh, and um, I want to make a few observations about what I ended up writing. So the first thing is this entire thing 
is one select statement. There's one semicolon. That's how many select statements I have. The, the, the full select statement with all of its clauses is visible here. Um, all the clauses we know so far. Uh, I can see joins. I can see um, select distinct. I can see order by. I have a where clause. I have a having clause. I have the with clause, which is part of the select statement. Um, and I've got a variety of different common table expressions. Um, one another thing that's really annoying, and you might, this is the thing you might have noticed me fighting with in the last video. I, I don't generally like uh, editing out my, my mistakes because I want you to maybe get that all programmers tend to make mistakes, even me. Um, here is something annoying for debugging purposes. It's especially annoying if you're recording yourself doing it and you can't, you know, loudly yell expletives without somebody else hearing them. Um, if you hit Control Enter in dBeaver, so it's not actually an SQL problem, it's a dBeaver thing. If you hit Control Enter, it tries to deduce what query you want to run. And what it pretty much does is it looks for everything before a semicolon starting at the last empty line. And what I had in the last video was something like this. I put some white space between the with clause stuff and my select statement. And if I try running this, it, it gets upset because it, maybe you can't read the error text, but it's saying that this doesn't exist. And the reason is because it's not SQL. If I paste this whole thing into Postgres, it will understand what I mean. But uh, dBeaver, when I hit Control Enter, thinks that this is all I want to run. And so it doesn't actually pull in my with clause. So that was annoying. Um, uh, and so the solution there is you do have to uh, jam everything in your with clause together. Don't include blank lines. I, I think you can comment blank lines out or something, but, but be careful about that. It isn't actually an error in your query. And I know from you know, years of experience teaching programming that uh, if you discover an error like that and you don't know how to fix it, that's, a, that's um, usually the remedy people use is just to never try the feature again. So if your first time using a with statement or with clause, you have this error, you'd say, I don't know how with clauses work. I'm never going to use them again. Don't do that. Don't get scared off. It's Beaver's fault. It's not yours. So that's the end of query one. And you might notice we have a lot of stuff happening here, but it's pretty well organized. By, by using my with clause, I actually am able to uh, organize my data and my thoughts pretty effectively in ascending order. I can do a small subproblem, then another subproblem, then I can slowly merge them together. And in practice, as I mentioned in my last video, if you end up being one of those database people, you could write select statements with a hundred uh, uh, common table expressions sitting inside that with clause. So let's take a look at query two. So here's query two. Um, select the customer name and order number of all products, of all, sorry, all orders that do not contain any product called Lime. So that's a weird wording. Any product called Lime. It doesn't say don't contain limes. Any product called Lime. Now what this is alluding to is the fact that the way you identify a product is with an ID number. A product has a name. There's no guarantee that you don't have two products in a system that are um, both called Lime. This is saying, I want every product whose name happens to be Lime, even if there's more than one of them, I want every product excluded. Um, so here's the way I would handle this. The concern here is this do not. Uh, and I want to do a thought experiment first. And I've actually done the same thought experiment in the previous video. I want to do this again. This is, it's for real this time. This is the place where this, this technique is supposed to be taught in the sequence. People say, if you are asked to select all orders that do contain limes, then you'll do something like this. I'll, first, I need to bring in, um, I'll, I'll select star and just as a starter here. I have to bring in the products table for, to get the uh, product name. So if I do this, I am selecting every name and price and kilograms bought and order number uh, and ID of every product in every order. And then if I want to select only the orders that do contain a lime, I can say select star where uh, name equals lime. Great, and that, that selects only the rows which are limes. And if I pull the order numbers out of that, I have a list of all the orders that contain limes. So how is it so difficult to select all the orders that do not contain limes? Well, a lot of people read this and they think, I know how to select orders that do, and I have an equals to find the limes. Why not just write name not equal to lime? And I get uh, all of this stuff, peach, pear, whatever. I take all of these order numbers. Let's look at them. Order 1001, 1002, 1003. Uh, in fact, actually, it's um, every order except for order 1000, which does contain a lime, so fair enough. It excludes order 1000. But order 1002 uh, and uh, order 1003 
uh, they all contain, oh sorry, Order 1002 doesn't. Order 1001 and Order 1003 both contain limes, and they're on this list. Because what I'm doing is selecting tuples that aren't limes. So anything an order contains that isn't a lime will pass this test. Just because an order contains something that's not a lime doesn't mean the order doesn't contain limes. So we have to be careful about this. The do not, the uh, negative qualifier there, doesn't make it uh, necessarily as easy as finding something that does exist. As I said last time, proving something doesn't exist is a bit more uh, of a thorough process. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write a shopping list just like before. I'm going to keep this up because I actually sort of want to recycle it. Um, I guess I could even use a with, my with clause as a way of writing a shopping list. So I want to keep track of the orders with lines. And that's this thing. Okay, so there are all my orders that do contain limes. And I know that the orders that don't contain limes is every order not in this collection. And I think, well, I have a list of orders with limes. I can easily make a list of all order numbers. And you don't need, I don't know if you need a common, uh, uh, an entry in your with clause for this, but just for the sake of simplicity. All order numbers as, I'm just going to select all order numbers. I'll select them distinct. Um, I'll select from orders. I could select from order contents. Um, if I select from orders, I have the advantage of not needing select distinct. And then I think, okay, so that means that all of the orders without limes, um, so order numbers all the orders without limes will be just the difference between those two things. It'll be select everything from all order numbers except those order numbers that appear in my list of orders with limes. And we'll test this out. So we're not done yet because we haven't gotten the uh, customer name or anything else, but uh, we have something to work with. Select star from order numbers without lines. I take a look at that and it says it's um, upset about select star orders with lines. So Okay, I missed the word from there. You'll notice the syntax errors it gives are not very helpful. It just said there was a problem. It didn't say what it was. Um, some parsers should be able to say it's, it, I need the word from, but it wasn't willing to give me the benefit of a doubt there. Okay, we'll try that again. Uh, okay, order number 1002. It turns out the only order that doesn't have a line in it is order 1002, but this is looking good. All I need now is to take that order number and work backwards and grab the customer name from it. So I want to do something very similar to what I did above. Um, it doesn't say that I have to sort it in a particular way. So I'll just select first name and last name and order number um, from order numbers without limes. And then I will join that back to the orders table. Take a look at that. And there it is. That's, this, uh, we've been doing a lot of work with uh, this particular customer and this particular customer's orders recently. So uh, again, I've broken it up into small pieces, and there might be other ways of getting what I want, but I like these pieces because each of them is really easy. It's easy to know which orders have limes. That's, that is a, uh, the positive condition, not the negative one. Which ones do have the property? If I know which ones do, I can figure out which ones don't by taking the complement of that. So I can easily get the ones with limes. I can, of course, easily get all orders. And you might, uh, if you wrote this yourself, you might avoid even having this entry by just putting this select statement uh, in place of this one. That, that'd be, that would be uh, fine too. Uh, and then I use the set difference operator to um, filter those out. And then I just join the result back. Now a warning for the assignment in the exam, um, a lot of people when they see a question like this do the hard part perfectly. They get up to basically this point and then they forget that the question was asking for more data than just the order number. So certainly the hard part of the question is which order numbers meet the criteria. But if you're asked for the customer's name, you've got to go back and join orders into it to grab the customer's name. So it's a mistake to you know, forget, do all the hard part, and then real, and, and, you know, not follow through. But it's also a mistake to fold in the name too early. If we're doing um, algebra involving order numbers, we should only work with order numbers. We should not be joining in the customer's name and have it come along for the ride. Because there are lots of reasons that can make a real mess out of things. In particular, although here it's harder to make that mess, if you have things like joins that show up, you don't want um, unnecessary attributes floating around because you don't know whether they're going to end up polluting your join. So that's fine. We'll, we'll head on down to query number three. 
select the names of all products, and there it is again, which do not appear in any orders. So this is one, I guess, given where we just came from, we might know already what to do here. Maybe we don't need a with clause. Um, so uh, I'll think, okay, I need the names of all products which do not occur in any orders. You, we could do this with just one query and I think one subquery, but I think I still, I, I'm addicted to with clauses now. Uh, there's one reason why writing this from scratch with no with clause could make a mess, and that is that it does look as if all we need to do is pull all the product names and then delete off any product names that appear in orders. But it's not that simple. Remember that the name doesn't define the product, and we really shouldn't be doing algebra on products without product IDs. And so for that reason, I am going to, um, I'm, I'm going to use uh, some common table expressions. Okay, so select distinct product ID from order contents. So this is all the product IDs that have ever ap appeared in any order. And then I'll have all IDs as select distinct, actually this is unnecessary here, product ID from products. You can try and convince yourself um, why this distinct is actually unnecessary. As long as a set operation happens eventually, all the duplicates get eliminated for you. Uh, at this point in the course, you'll not be marked down for including a distinct clause when you don't really need one. So it's no worry, I think, to add one anyway. And it's better to play it safe, to know that you're keeping to the relational model. Um, you'll see later that you have some queries on assignments that are so hard to execute that pruning them down a bit actually can help you, you know, get them fast enough to work. Um, so IDs not in orders is now just everything else, um, or it's the difference between these two things. So select star from IDs in orders, except, uh, whoops, nope, wrong way around, all IDs, except select star from IDs in orders. Now if you look at this, you could do one uh, common table, just just this last one. You could get rid of both of these. I like this just because it, it reminds me of the old-fashioned assignment statement style of programming where I just make one small step. I, I do one step at each line and once I'm done that step I don't worry about it ever again. The less clutter I have the less likely it is I've made some mistake and if I have made a mistake the more likely it is I can debug it. So I now have all the IDs that aren't in orders. All I have to do is follow through and grab the product name associated with the, the, those IDs. Autocomplete Botch that one up, not namespace, name, from IDs not in orders, which will be product IDs, um, natural join, products. We'll try that out. Now, I, I really should have run some intermediate queries there. Uh, I, I took a, I gambled a bit and it looks like it paid off. I now have the names of all products that appear in no orders. So a key issue, something I might get emails about, is why couldn't I just select the names and take, uh, do one simple query where I select name from products and select name from products join contents and then difference them. And the reason is you can't assume that two products don't have the same name. Because if they don't, why do we need a, a product ID? If we have a product ID, that is the only thing we can trust as the unique identifier of a product. And so we should do that. We should um, take that at face value. And if you don't, you could lose marks. Um, assignment questions are typically hard enough that they're marked almost entirely on function with only with marks only deducted if you cut some corners. For exam questions, which are a bit simpler, you would lose marks for, for, not, um, for using name directly instead of folding it at the end because the whole point of having this normalized schema with keys and uh, unique identifiers is to avoid that problem happening. The same as if you're keeping a personnel database and you say, hey, the company's small, we don't have any employees with the same name. Well, the minute two employees have the same name, you're in some real trouble. And so if you bother to create these surrogate keys, you better go and use them. Uh, and so just, I mean, just to sew that up, the real s significance of this is there could be two products both called pineapple and one of them occurs in orders and the other one doesn't. We still want the one that doesn't to show up in our result. Okay, so that's query three. We only have eight queries. We're doing pretty good here. As far as three lectures worth of material, we're doing pretty good. Hopefully things don't escalate severely in difficulty. No, that wasn't, that's not so bad. Um, print the name and the price of the most expensive product in the products table. And actually, this is gonna be so inspiring for me that maybe I'll head back and we'll try query three again using a certain shortcut. 
Um, so what this wants is just the most expensive product in, in the products table. And one thing it's not doing that you have to worry about on the assignment is it is implying that there won't be any ties. Um, but we should still engineer so that ties uh, aren't, uh, so that ties are possible. So we want to make sure if two products both have the maximum price um, that we can still uh, get both of them. So there could be more than one product that is the most expensive product. This is sort of, I don't know, working around that. The assignment question is very specific. You must make sure that the ties, um, that everybody involved in a tie is included in the result. So we're going to engineer it so it works that way. Okay, the first question though is, what does it mean to be the most expensive product? So we're only talking about the products table and it refers to this attribute as defining it. So let's just take a look at the products table. All right, so I would like to find what is the most expensive product. It's raspberries and that's you know worth every penny. Uh, I would like to, in this case, select that. Now remember that you could just write, you could be a smart ass and write something like select the name where the product ID equals four. You could short circuit it, you get a zero. Um, you, you also don't know the maximum price. You've seen it, but you're not allowed to assume the maximum price is 10. If I change my data, it could be something else. So the first question is, how do I get just the maximum price? How do I figure that out? Um, and the reason this is actually a surprisingly tough query is if you do this on an assignment, you'll catch your mistake. But on an exam, it's easy to fall into a certain trap here. Uh, and so I'm going to begin by saying how we can compute the maximum price and nothing else. And if we know already about that trick where we can aggregate with no grouping, we might see what we'd have to do. So I'm going to use the max aggregation function and no grouping and just select max of price per kilogram. We know that without grouping, the group is defined to be everything. So I have that. And I think, well, that sounds fine. I, I, I can get the maximum this way. Let's just try this trick. This is not, I, I don't recommend this. Um, select star from products where the price per kilogram equals the maximum price per kilogram. And it says can't, sorry. That's why I said don't try it. You'd be too disappointed. Um, I think SQL Lite lets you do it and then gives you garbage as its result. So it doesn't work. You can't do this because it's you're trying to aggregate in a place that makes no sense. You're allowed to aggregate in this column selection clause because that's done at the end. But if you're aggregating before grouping on a query with no grouping to begin with, what do you want it to do? How can the price equal the result of agglomerating a bunch of things if you haven't even made groups yet? So you can't do this. It's not this easy. Um, but back to what we had a minute ago, uh, we actually can do something. We can use a certain kind of nested query that makes this really easy. And here's the key point. Um, in my other short video, I talked about those extra tricks you can do. And one of them is uh, tricks where you select a single value. So this is a, formally a relation. It has one column, which is just called max, and one row. But really, it's a relation with one entry, so one row of one value. And that means it's a scalar. It's a single number. And it turns out I'm allowed to use a nested query like this one anywhere else that I need a single number, as long as it evaluates to one number. So it does. So I'm actually allowed to write something like select star from products um, where the price per kilogram equals this number. And the key here is that the number I'm computing isn't this query, it's a separate query. I run the entire query, I get the result, and then I ask, is price per kilogram equal to that result? So we'll run that. Um, it's like star from products where price per kilogram is equal to, just like that. So what we've done is we've selected from our products table the uh, every row, and then we've only kept those rows whose price happens to be equal to this scalar value that I've already computed. Um, and uh, this is nice. And what's also nice about this, if you think about it, if two rows both had price 10, they would both pass this test because this is just the number 10. But fortunately for us, we don't have to know that in advance. We compute it as we go. So that's query four. But wait a minute. If I'm allowed to use subqueries in my where clause, doesn't that open up a lot of other doors? So here, I'm not allowed to ask if this number equals something unless the result from the subquery is a number. 
if I have a subquery that emits a list of numbers, I can't just ask if a number equals that list. But it turns out that I am allowed to ask if a number is in a subquery that produces a list. And so I'll talk about that in a minute, but I want to polish this example off with one more um, variation, which is really odd. So it's, it's going to look really strange. Um, I want to use this same subquery again. And we'll just, we'll go back to it in its original form. So what does this actually do? This produces a table with one row and one column whose value is the maximum price in this other table. And I can even rename it. So now it's called price per kilogram. What I want is every row from the products table whose price per kilogram matches up with this price per kilogram, which is called the same thing. In fact, I think, wait a minute, I have a column in common. This new um, subquery is producing a column that, equal, that has the same name as a column in my products table. And so I could use a join. Uh, I'll do it, I'll indent properly. And then I'll put this up here. And because I'm joining it, I do have to give it a name. So I have that. Um, price per kilogram is 10, product ID number four, and then raspberry. And then um, I have to select, I guess it only wants the name and price per kilogram. So I should be careful to make sure in both of my queries, I am selecting that. So it's a very odd use of a join. Like, it just looks bizarre. The reason why it's clever, whoops, is that uh, there are times when the maximum that I want may not be the global maximum. I may end up wanting a maximum for each group or something. And so it's useful to know this doesn't generalize. This is for looking for one number. If instead I want to match things up to their respective maximum or something, this logic of making a clever nested table and then joining it back in is pretty powerful. Uh, and in this case, maybe a little bit overkill, but uh, something we, we're going to want to hold on to for later in the sequence. But before we go later in the sequence, let's just head uh, up and revisit query three. Okay, so we have this, um, this long sequence we had to use set operations for. But I observe, uh, I can get a list of all the products that do appear in orders pretty easily. So I select star from, or I select, sorry, I select product ID from order contents. And it's going to contain some duplicates, but yeah, there is every product that ever appears in an order. I can also uh, use the same logic I used below, select um, name from products, where the product ID of that product is not one of these things. But I can't just say not equal, so I'm not allowed to write this because of course it's not equal. This is a number, this is a list of things, but I do have an operation I can use. If my subquery returns a single column, but a bunch of rows, it's effectively a list of values. And I am allowed to ask if it's in or not in that list. So we'll try this. In this case, it gives me apple and pineapple. So this is a good approach. I like this approach for lots of reasons. The big reason is I don't have to learn any new syntax. Um, this is certainly helpful, and this proves the point. It's a good sales job for the not in operator. Uh, but keep in mind, now you have to learn how not in works. If you want to make sure you get it this way, you have to learn how not in works. When can you use it? When can't you? Might be shorter, but maybe this requires less thinking. And this is more reliable because you have to know all those operations anyway. And more importantly, you can't always trust that you'll have a case this simple. So uh, this is the general solution. This is a specific one. Of course, if you catch on to this solution being viable on an exam or something, you've just saved yourself some time. But at the usual risk of, be careful that maybe you get the general version of the question where this solution doesn't work. So we do have in the WHERE clause a couple of options for folding in nested queries um, that do make things easier if we have certain special cases. So we have that here. We saw that already in query number four, and that was great. Uh, and so we're ready to move on to query five, but keeping in mind that this second solution didn't come out of nowhere, and we might need it again soon. So, oh, better not spoil query number six. Um, here we go. Print the order number of every order uh, which contains the most expensive product in the products table. 
Okay, assume nothing about the data. Well, now that doesn't seem too tough. Just like before, I'm asking for the most expensive product. Now, maybe there are ties, and I will design a solution that can accommodate the ties. This is a bit vague on whether it's required, but I will uh, still, uh, assuming nothing about the data, I shouldn't assume that there won't be two products tied for most expensive. So what do I want? So I need to, uh, whether the product is expensive is based on its price per kilogram, not how much of it I purchased. So I have to join, um, I'm going to say select, we'll start with star, from product, natural join, order contents. So we'll look at that. And we've seen this before. I want to select every order which contains the product that from the list of all products has the highest price. And I can again use that trick that I use in the where clause. I can say where the uh, price per kilogram is equal to, and then I do a separate nested query, select the maximum price per kilogram from uh, products. So I have that, and what it wants is just the order number. Oh great, I did it. I found all the orders that had it. So this where clause trick is great. There's no way that I'm ever gonna need that weird natural join thing. I'm just gonna do all the work in the where clause from now on. So the reason this was so easy was because again, I'm asking for a global maximum. I'm saying everything in the whole database whose price matches the maximum price of everything in the whole database. But what if I want something more local? What if I'm asking a question about a specific order? Well, there's no way you're ever going to do that, Bill. We've already spent all this time talking about the where clause and stuff. Let's take a look at query number six. Oh, don't want to spoil query number seven. I got to put more spaces between these things. Um, okay, print the name. And I'm thinking also in a real lecture, this would be an issue, but you're actually, you probably could be staring at the whole set of queries right now. You may have skipped over this whole part of the video to just spoil it and go right to query eight. So query number six. Print the name of the most expensive item or items. That is not a good thing to see. Or items in each order. So when you see that, that's a sign that we're that things are getting real. Uh, we have to um, now figure out what the most expensive thing in each order is, and uh, based on that, for each order, output the most expensive item. Um, so there are a couple of ways uh, of interpreting this, but this is being very clear. All it wants is by price per kilogram. I mean, you could you could argue the most expensive item in an order, you, you should maybe consider its total price, like price times number of kilograms purchased. That isn't what this says. It just says by price per kilogram. So what do we do? Um, it's not as easy as asking a question about a global number. We want not the most expensive item. We want the most expensive item in this order. Um, and so uh, what we have to, I guess, figure out is, maybe over on the side, uh, before I print the name of that item, I need to figure out um, what the most expensive item in each order is somehow. Okay, so the way I'm gonna do this is uh, I am going to try and compute uh, by grouping the order, uh, the order contents table into buckets for each order, I actually can compute the most expensive price. It's hard to get the product out of that, but I think I can get the price out of it. So I'll demonstrate that. So let's start by selecting star from order contents. Okay, so there we have it. I notice order 1001, that's these three cells here. Can I select multiple cells? Yes, I can. Great. Um, in order 1001, if I make a bucket for order 1001, what I could do if I join that up to products, so I'll run it again. There's my order 1001. If I join that to products, I can look at the price per kilogram column and find the maximum value in it. And that's a form of aggregation. That's the, ag that's the max aggregation function. So let's try that. Let's select order number and the maximum price per kilogram from all of this stuff. And I will group by order number. All right, so order 1002 and 1003, they, they contain raspberries, so it's not surprising their max is 10. Order 1001, its max is 6.1. The, the floating point rendering in dBeaver is a bit weird. Uh, order 1000, the maximum price is 5. Okay, so how does that help me? 
So uh, the first issue here is that it isn't as simple. You cannot in any way go directly through this aggregation to name. You have to do the aggregation with just the order number and the price and then take what you get and somehow link it back to real products. Notice that right now all I have is the price. Order 1002's most expensive item cost 10. Okay, but what was it? How do I know what it was? Here's my observation. Where else do I see the price 10? Well, it is originally the price per kilogram of something. In fact, I could even go back and rename it as that. And we might look back to that, that peculiar second solution to query 4, which is where I did a join. And the join just seemed unreasonable because I could have used the WHERE clause. I can't use the WHERE clause to solve this problem. You can try. Um, in this case, because there's a different maximum per order, the WHERE clause, before aggregation or whatever, doesn't know anything about that. So I have to have some way of matching up the maximum price to the um, uh, price of each item. And I now have that. I think, wait a minute, where have I seen a column called price per kilogram before? Well, that was in the products table. I could take this synthetic price per kilogram column and join it back to my products table. Now, before I do that, uh, only uh, any sensible person would realize this is the kind of query where you need to add some uh, common table expressions. So I'm going to call this as um, order max prices as. And I'm really losing patience with dbeaver's funny way of preformatting brackets. Uh, we have that. I'm going to indent this. A very common mistake to make with with clauses is to accidentally have a semicolon at the end of one of them. Make sure you get rid of any semicolons. So I'm now going to select uh, as a test, select star from order max prices, my synthetic uh, temporary table, natural join products, and see what I get. And sure enough, it matches up the prices. So price 5, that's a lime. Price 10, that's ID4, a raspberry. Price 6, that's a peach. So what does it want? It wants print the name of the most expensive item or items, if there's a tie, in this case there are no ties, in each order. And the output should have the column's order number, name of most expensive item. And in fact, I'm actually uh, pretty much ready to go here. Um, so let's see. I've got uh, select uh, order num and uh, uh, the name of the item as most expensive item, just to, just to clear that up. And I have this. So there's one way of solving it. And it requires being you know, devious with the use of natural join. But then the question is, um, what if you don't necessarily catch the use of that join? That's a little bit too devious. This join is perfectly uh, sensible, and the aggregation is perfectly sensible. Computing the maximum price of each order is something that you should be able to do uh, with little difficulty by the time you get to the exam. That would be a relatively uh, easy exam question. But maybe this is coming out of nowhere. And you might be looking at that and freaking out, thinking, how am I expected to figure out a trick like that um, in a short amount of time? So there's a second solution I'll develop, and I'll start from the same point. So suppose I have this, and suppose I didn't notice I had that clever join. So I'm, I'll just call this table, um, I'll call this column max uh, order price. Okay, so I start from that. Again, computing the max price for the order isn't the hard part. That's something we've, we've already seen aggregation of that sort, similar to computing the total price of the order. So select star from order max prices. Great, there we go. Order max price 10, 6.10, uh, whatever. Um, the question is, how do I turn this back into something that works with products? And there is another way of doing it. It really is the same as the join option, but might be easier to deduce. So here's what I want to do. Um, I would like to um, come up with, let's see, I'm going to select star from. First, I'm going to take order max prices. And I'm going to join that to order contents. Because what I want to do is I want to look for each order at both its maximum price and each item in the order at once. Because I need some way of associating the order with the products in the order. So I'll start with this. So what this does, the join that I'm doing here, the standard natural join, just joins on order numbers. So now for each order, I get a column with the maximum price as well as all the columns from order contents. So order 1001, max price 6.10, ID 3, uh, kilograms purchase 10, ID 5, kilograms purchase 2.5. And then I can say, hey, if I want the product names and the product prices, I could even expand that join to include products. Okay, order 1001 has ID th product ID 3, and the maximum price of anything in the order was this number, and the price of this product was 5. So it must not be that product. Order number 1001 has ID 5, 
which has maximum price, uh, and the order's maximum price is 6.10, and that happens to be the price of this product. So maybe what I want to do is take the result of this weird join and filter it for the rows where the price of the item I'm looking at matches the price, uh, the maximum order price. And so I'll do that. I'm going to also, um, you know, I'll do that. So where, and I've named the column max order price, and I want that to equal the price of a single item. And uh, if I take a look at that, it actually ends up giving me the same result. I just have to clean it up a little bit. I want the order number and the name as the most expensive item. Run that, and we get the same result as before. Let's just verify that. It's in a different order. Ordering isn't significant unless you are asked to produce a particular order. So I could do both. And this is an example, in fact, because we saw that there's a crafty join I could do, this is an example of sort of that weird backdoor join that I was, I had a pretty negative opinion of in the lecture. This is a very healthy use of it, though. I'm not doing what is obviously a natural join. Um, if I were, so that is to say, this operation up here is obviously a natural join. Doing that with a where clause doesn't help anybody. This, it might not be obvious it's a join, so using a where clause, if you get the right answer, that's great. That does the trick. Um, and we'll see later, there actually are other flavors of join that let you do all sorts of strange, unnatural things that you never thought possible with a join using some sort of a join operation instead of a where clause. Using those is also great, but unless the question specifically tells you not to use a where clause or forces you to use a particular kind of join, this is a great way of solving it. Um, and so that's the typical issue with these queries is there tend to be lots of different ways of getting the answer. The key obstacle that I hope people can overcome isn't finding the answer a particular way, but believing the answer can be attained. Because a lot of times people will complain, this question is impossible to answer. There's no way SQL can do that. Well, if set theory can do it, then so can SQL. Okay, so we've seen query six, and we've noticed that unfortunately that weird issue from earlier with the weird join did show up after all. So we just hold our breath and hope query seven isn't going to make anything worse. Oh, oh and I'm, okay. <laughs> I don't want to spell query eight. Query seven for each product, print its name and the number of other products that are more expensive. So I'm going to answer this in, in a few different ways. Uh, th this is the kind of question that can eat up tons of time because of all the different things to think about. The main thing I'm going to observe starting out is what we want here is to compare products to other products. So let's just take a look at our products. Let's start from products. All right, um, we take a look at that. I would like to be able to compare the price of an apple to the price of a pear, and the price of a lime and a raspberry and a peach and a pineapple and whatever. Uh, so what I need is the ability to run a comparison like that. And, and we, we might think about this and say, okay, so we have these operators that can operate within a single row. That's the where clause or the sigma operator in relational algebra. I've got these operators that can batch up different rows, which would be grouping and aggregation. What I want to do here is neither of those things. I don't have different rows yet, or, or I, I, don't want to, I don't want to, for example, put apple and pear in a group together because I also want to compare pear to lime and pear to raspberry. So I don't want to have apple and pear stuck together because then I can't stick pear with lime and I can't stick pear with raspberry. So it turns out grouping and aggregation doesn't help me. What I actually want is to use the where clause. So I want to create rows that have two different products in them. Um, and I want to create basically all pairs of products. Once I have all pairs of products, I can begin doing stuff like comparing how expensive one product is compared to the other product. So this is actually a, a good use for something called an outer join, which we're going to come back to later. It, it, that's a post-exam three uh, topic. That's one of our advanced topics. So we, we'll actually see the whole query again later. In the posted version of these exercises, I will include the outer join for people that are curious. But I want to cover, I think, three other versions of the query that use more basic operators. And it is true that, yes, the outer join version is a little bit cleaner looking. And people would say, well, then there's no point in doing the complicated version. The issue is the outer join itself is harder to notice, and it's generally a bit more cumbersome to work with. And so we, we do, I think it is valuable to work with these from the most basic operators. So here's what I'm going to, here's my game plan. The, in order to know which products are more expensive than which other ones, I need some way of comparing two products together. That's my first objective. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to construct a table whose rows contain entries for two different products at once. And then I'm going to filter that down by uh, to include the uh, whether one product is more expensive than another. So here's how I'm going to do the first part. 
I would like to pair up products. I would like to consider all possible pairs of products. So I'm going to say select star from products, cross join product. That's this is actually a pretty legitimate use of the cross join operator. Now the database engine's complaining. It's saying, how do I join a table to itself? Like how will you differentiate its columns? Which is a good point. What do you call the columns if both tables have a column called product ID? So I'm going to rename each table products as P1 and products as P2. Now, strangely, when the table, when the, when, it, when the result comes back, dBeaver doesn't label them the way it should. But we can see now there's apple paired up with apple, and then pear and lime and raspberry and peach and pineapple, and then there's pear paired up with apple, pear, lime, peach. And it, it generates a whole 36, there are six products. It generates 36 rows with every possible pairing of products. So here's what's interesting about that. I now have enough information to demonstrate relationships between products. So suppose what I want to do now is keep only those pairs where the first product is less expensive. So what I want eventually is to, is, is to for each product, like Apple, I want to know how many products cost more. So why don't I take the result of my cross join and filter out only those rows where the first product costs less than the second one. And that's actually not too tough. P1 dot price per kilogram is less than P2 dot price per kilogram. So we'll try this. Notice that we have Apple, its price is 3.5. Pear has a price 4. Apple has price 3.5. Lime has price 5. Apple is 3.5. Raspberry is 10. Let's go take a look at the rows for peach. The only thing more expensive than a peach is a raspberry. So there's no rows that are left for peach besides the one with peach and raspberry. So I look at this and I say there's actually something quite interesting going on here, which is that there are four products um, that are more expensive than an apple. The only thing that is cheaper than an apple is a pineapple, and that's for obvious reasons. You can you, That's an exercise for you to figure out. Um, so there's four products that are more expensive than an apple, and there are four rows in my result. Well, that's neat. There are three products that are more expensive than a pair, and there are three rows in my result. And there are two products more expensive than a lime. And hey, it turns out that all I have to do with my result is figure out how many rows go with each product ID, and then I have that number. And I can do that with grouping and aggregation. I can make a bucket for each product ID, or this the product ID on the left, uh, and then I can uh, count how many rows go into each bucket. So that's my strategy for my first solution method. Um, I'm going to use a common table for this because it's oh, okay. Autocomplete for some reason wants to use this weird Postgres meta feature. Weird, okay. Um, so I'm going to call this product pairs as, and then the funny bracket thing happens. Uh, I'm going to keep this. I'm actually also going to select. I'm going to be a bit more stringent with my select. I only want to keep the product ID. So we'll call this p1 dot product ID. We'll call that as product one, uh, and I'll keep p two dot product ID uh, as product two. And the interpretation of my query is in the result p one uh, product one is always cheaper than product two. So I take that and I will now write my main query. I'm going to select product one as product ID from um, my product pairs. And I'm going to group by product one. So group by product one. And I'm also going to keep at each step the count of the number of product twos, which are the more expensive products. Um, in fact, actually, let's write that in. Let's write well-documented code. So I'm going to have a product ID, and then the other column is a more expensive product. And I'm going to count the number of more expensive products. And then this doesn't need to be here anymore because I've just called it product ID. So we'll try this. Um, and so here it is uh, complaining about something. Oh, right. So I, I tried group by product one, which doesn't exist anymore. There we go. Product ID 3 has two products that are more expensive, which is a so product ID 3 would be a, a lime. That looks good. Product ID 6, a pineapple, has five products that are more expensive. Product ID 1, which is apple, has four. This looks good. I pretty much have what I need, but I'm missing one really important thing. 
we might notice that one product is missing and it's product ID 4. Um, there is no entry for product ID 4 because it was the most expensive product. And you might notice there is this little warning up here, be careful about that. And so the problem is, what I'm doing is I'm counting the number of rows, more expensive things, in my product pairs table. But the issue is my product pairs table doesn't contain any, pro any rows where Raspberry product ID 4 is the thing on the left because and I'll just I'll break this off and then we can I'll just take another look at the product pairs table so product 1 has four rows of four things that are more expensive product 2 has 3 product 3 has 2 product 5 has 1 product 6 has 5 but product 4 doesn't appear in here because there's nothing more expensive than product 4 and so I have to sort of jam that in I have to figure out a way of including the most expensive product because it will always get excluded from this um, and so the way I'm gonna handle that uh, is I am going to just write another I'm just gonna handle that with its own special case um, so I'm going to say, uh, well, okay, first I'll turn this into its into a CTE. Um, call it most product, or actually that's not a very good way of writing it. Um, products except most expensive as, uh, page down by accident, as, and then I do this, uh, I'm going to call this um, more expensive count, for lack of a better name for it. And then I'm going to say, okay, so most expensive product as, and here's a good way to use, a good excuse to use that cheap uh, qu uh, query for solution. So I'm going to select product ID zero as more expensive count because there are zero things more expensive than the most expensive product from products where the price per kilogram is equal to the maximum possible price. I've written a lot there. I probably want to um, quickly verify that this runs by itself. You saw earlier I had some issues with getting the nested query to, to agree with dBeaver. Um, so we'll try that. Looks like it works. Product ID 4 has a count of 0. Uh, and so then I can combine the two things. So I could say all products um, and counts as. Uh, and then that would be select star from products except most expensive. It's nice. dBeaver has nice autocomplete for a lot of things I don't need, but it would be great if it could autocomplete the names of these tables. Uh, union, select star from most expensive product. And we actually discover uh, this is a spe the same problem that we had in the end of the relational algebra examples where we have to construct these two sort of disjoint things and then union them together. It turns out when we see that, usually that's a sign an outer join might be helpful. So I have that and then what else do I need from this query? It's asking me for the name and the number of products that are more expensive. So I need to then take the result and I need to select the product name and the we call it more expensive count from all products and counts natural join product to bring that name back in there. We'll try that and there it is. We now have the name of each product and the number of products that are more expensive. So there we did. We did query number seven. Now we're not done. Query number eight isn't done yet. Um, but also I, I think we actually need to, we owe it to ourselves to meditate a bit on what we had to do to query number seven. So query number seven was an example of a good use of a cross join. And I talked in the lecture when this came up that cross join doesn't really tend to reveal things about data. We use it for sort of utility reasons. Here's a good reason to use it. We used it because we needed to compare all pairs of something. The cross join didn't give us any relationship. It constructed a relationship that we could then leverage. We then filtered it out. There is actually a clever type of join we could use that isn't a, an outer join that would also, a, a certain kind of theta join would actually do this because if you notice, it's a cross join followed by a sigma. And so a theta join could actually be used to model this. I really hope you don't get a question this complicated for relational algebra. You might get an SQL question like this, but relational algebra for this would be pretty painful. I want to show off a couple of similar solutions that get around this problem in some other way. So I'm going to copy and paste parts of this. 
Um, and I, I'm so sorry in advance about the scrolling. You might want to pull up the solution over on the side um, as I talk about this so that we can, uh, when I talk about it, you don't, you don't get nauseous watching me scroll up and down. So we noticed the big concern with this solution was that the most expensive product gets left out, which is really annoying. So what if we go back to that point in time? So I, I was able to figure out all of the products except the most expensive. So I'm going to call this, um, I'm just going to call this Q for now because we don't know what it means yet. Uh, I have all the products except for the most expensive. And the way we got around that was by just patching in the products that are the most expensive. So we have everything here but Raspberry. What are our other options? Uh, I could say, okay, the issue is happening here. In my cross join, there is a row that pairs up Raspberry with everything else. The problem is I only keep rows where the price of Raspberry is less than the price of the thing on the right. So one clever observation that we could make is that the price of Raspberry isn't less than anything, which is why Raspberry doesn't show up once I've done the where clause. But the price of Raspberry is less than or equal to something because everything does get paired up with itself. There will be, a, in the cross join, a, a row which pairs up lime to lime, and apple to apple, and raspberry to raspberry. So we could use a less than or equal to operator here and keep the row where raspberry gets paired up to itself. We still throw away all the other ones because raspberry's price is higher than all of the other things. So there's nothing that raspberry's price isn't, there's nothing that raspberry's price is less than or equal to except for raspberry itself. But if I try running this, we actually have gotten around the problem, but we've created a different problem. So now we keep a row for every product and itself, which means this count is going to be off by one because it's going to count a product as being more expensive than itself. And it turns out we have a pretty easy solution there. We could just do a minus one and we get the result that we want. We know that every product will have an extra row, which is comparing it to itself, and so we just subtract that off. We just account for it by doing a minus one. This is really clever, um, and uh, this is the kind of thing that if you notice a trick like this, you might save yourself some time. But it's worth knowing both methods, because just like any other trick, this doesn't work in all cases. It does work in this case. Uh, I have one more clever solution. Um, that actually gets around uh, a lot of trouble that we had here. So it, this issue of having Raspberry, the most expensive product, getting excluded, we actually have another way um, around that, which is when we compute our pairs, we can avoid throwing away any rows at all. The reason why we had that problem to begin with, with Raspberry being missing, was that we went and threw rows away. So why don't we just not throw rows away? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to showcase that by rewriting the whole thing. So I'm going to select uh, p1.product. Okay, I'm going to copy and paste. Uh, I'm going to still rewrite the whole thing, but I'm going to do part of it by copying and pasting. All work is derivative. So uh, I've got that. Okay. Um, oh, whoops. Okay, so we've got this. Uh, let's just run this quickly, make sure that. Okay, so we are now generating all possible pairs. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rename, I'm going to not copy and paste, I'm going to rename these columns, I'm going to turn off caps lock, I'm going to rename these columns column one, or product one and product two, because I'm no longer going to have one be the cheap one and one be the expensive one. In fact, I'm going to add a brand new column whose value is zero or one. And what it's going to do is tell me, yes or no, was product one less expensive? And I'm allowed to do that. We are, we've seen in my other video that I posted, there is this mechanism for uh, handling discrete cases. I think that there are three things that could happen here. Product one is more expensive, product two is more expensive, or they're tied. And all I care about is yes or no, is product one less expensive? So I'm going to use a case uh, statement, the case when. Um, so I'm going to write it like this, case end. And my first case would be when p1.price per kilogram is less than p2.price per kilogram. We'll scroll down so we can actually read this. When p1.price per kilogram is less than um, p2.price per kilogram, we do then, the answer is yes, one. Uh, else, it's zero. And we'll call the column, is p1 less expensive? We'll just, well, we want to write readable code, so we'll run that. Notice how I haven't thrown away any rows at all. Every pro all 36 rows of my cross join are still there. So what I have, let's look at product one. 
that's the apple. I think there were four things that were more expensive than the apple. This third column tells me, is this particular product more or less expensive than the apple? If it's more expensive, then the value is uh, one. You might notice if I now group these uh, rows by product one and I add up, if I take the sum of this third column, it'll add up to the total number of products that were more expensive. And I don't have anything missing, I just have a bunch of zeros. So Raspberry product four has this six rows of all zeros. If I add up those zeros, the sum is zero. So there are zero products more expensive, but there is still a presence in the table. So I can take this um, and I'm gonna make this uh, in my with statement. I'm gonna make it, we'll call this, this is still gonna be product pairs. And then I'm gonna tab in everything else. Um, and uh, I, I still have the issue of product IDs, so I, I want to do one more step before I join things back. So I would say, okay, my more expensive counts. I'm going to select, um, let's see, I'm going to select product one as product ID. So I, I want to compute the number of things that are more expensive for each product in my uh, product pairs table. I'm gonna sum up, um, is P1 less expensive as, and of course that sum is the number of things that are more expensive, um, more expensive count. Uh, I think, okay, in the version I post, I might write, I might call this, is P2 more expensive? Because it looks like I'm not talking about less expensive as much as I was thinking I would. Um, from product pairs, and now I group by uh, product one. I can't group by product ID because that doesn't exist yet. The renaming doesn't happen until after the grouping. So I have that. I'm going to uh, run that whole thing before I go further. Select so star from more expensive counts, and we'll run that. And we see the counts that we want. Product four is in there as we expect. No special treatment was needed. Because I found this clever case when statement to do it, I didn't need to worry about it because Raspberry never vanished from my table. I just got a bunch of zeros that I added up. Uh, all I need to do now to complete this is I have to add the name to my selection. So I select name and the more expensive count from this and I have to join this to products. And we see, we get the result again. So there's three ways of doing it. The second way is a variation on the first. The third one completely works around the biggest problem that, that the um, filtering approach introduces. It does that by um, using this case when statement. Ooh, I did something bad there. I should use the as keyword. You might have noticed I didn't need the as keyword, but it's a matter of self-respect. So by using case when, we actually completely subvert the question and we get around the hardest part. It requires remembering how to use case when, which is a pretty ugly bit of notation, but it can really help us if we can identify a case where it's useful. So that's query seven. And we're almost an hour and 15 minutes into this. We might as well just tap query number eight. So we'll scroll on down. Um, Construct a table with the three columns below. So what I want is, uh, and it actually gives the entire example. I'm gonna have to scroll this off screen because there's too much of it, but um, order number, product name, and this strange column called relative price. And I'll spoil it for you. If you didn't use case win already, you're gonna have to do it here. So relative price will be this. Um, if the product's price, so that's price per kilogram, not total purchased weight or anything, just the price per kilogram, for each order, I have to figure out the average price of an item. And then for each item in the order, I have to figure out whether that item was below the average price or above the average price, or in some cases, equal to the average price. For order 1000, Lime's price is equal to the average because there's only one item and it's a Lime. So what do I need to get this done? I think before I do anything else, I'm going to need to compute the average price of an item in each order. And there is an aggregation function called average that I can use for that. So I'm going to start by doing that uh, in, in a vacuum just by itself. So I'm going to select order number, and then I'm going to average out uh, the price per kilogram of, of an item. Remember that price per kilogram comes to us from the products table. So price per kilogram as I'm going to call it average price from order contents, natural join products. So we'll start with that. Oops, I actually have to make sure I group. Group by order number. 
All right, so there are my average prices per order. And uh, it turns out that this is actually a lot less scary than it looks once you figure out what it's asking. It's about breaking the query down the right way. So I now have the average price for the order. And if we think about it, all I'm really doing now is taking this result and for each order, I'm, I'm going to join it back into the order contents table so that for each item I can see both the price of the, the order number, the item, and the average price of the order. And then I just have to compare two columns in the same row. So I'm going to first set up my, uh, my, my main query here. So with um, order averages as, and then I wait for it to get up set about brackets. Um, So with this, I want to select, I'm going to start by showing off the point I just made. Select star from um, order contents, natural join, order averages. So we see there's now for order 1001, we can see product ID, kilograms bought, average price of the whole order. Order 1001, different product, number of kilograms bought, average price of the order. Um, I need to know the price of each individual product, the price per kilogram, so I'm going to use pro the products table for that. But once I've done that, I'm actually pretty much like done um, the, the funny table shenanigans. All I have to do is find a way of working with each row. Each individual row now contains enough information for me to finish off. So I need to know if the price of this item, which is 6.1, is greater than or less than this average price, which I have in the same row. So all I have to do is work with different columns in the same row of the table. So what I'm down to is more of an aesthetic thing. It's presenting the data. So what do I want? I want order number, the name of the product, and a uh, one of three cases. If the average is less than the price of the product, I want to say above average. If the average is greater, I want to say below average. If the average is equal, I want to say equal to average. So I'm going to start a new line for this. But what I want is a case, uh, a case when statement. And again, I'm fighting with the weird brackets. So there we go. Case and the first case would be when the price of this item is less than the average price then the result will be the string um, below average. Notice that between the statements, the bits of a case statement, we don't have commas. We just keep writing the word when. When the price per kilogram is greater than the average price, then above average. And then else, we just say average. And I have to call this, it's actually very specific in the query, I have to call this relative price. So I remember the word as, relative price. We'll try that out. So order 1000, lime is average. Order 1001, lime is below average, peach is above. And if I take a look at it, order 1001, lime is below average, peach is above. It's in a different order than I expected, but order isn't being marked unless you're told to produce the same order. And that goes on the assignment as well. If you get all of the rows you need, no rows that you don't need, and each row matches one of the rows in the result, then um, you, you have the answer correct, unless you're specifically told to produce a, 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 a given order. Remember, of course, that the number of columns in their order is non-negotiable. You do have to have all the columns we tell you to have and no other columns, and the columns should be in the same order and they should have the same names if we, if we specified any of those things. So we have this. This is actually, I mean, especially all the buildup we've had, this is actually quite a bit less than, you know, all of the, the horrifying permutations of query seven. It's arguably doing something a, a bit deeper um, in terms of the, the analysis we're doing because it, it's actually doing a sort of global local comparison. It's comparing each item in an order to the price for that entire order. Uh, but because of the way SQL works and because we've co come a long way since our first introduction to it, it wasn't so hard to conceptualize what pieces of data we need. And that's why we're getting into a phase, um, most of which will come after exam three, but a lot of which will maybe start to form on assignment uh, three. Um, where it's not as much about what can we do, it's knowing we can definitely get this done in SQL, but it's a question of how do we break down these operations in a way that makes it clear how to build them into the query we need? How do we start turning the request that we've been given to generate a query uh, into a sequence of small expressions that we put on our with clause and then uh, agglomerate together? And also, of course, how do we avoid the, the um, smoke and mirrors that comes with a complicated request like this? This looks hideous, 
because we say, how am I supposed to get this above average, below average thing? Um, and being able to identify stuff like, hey, wait a minute, that's just three cases. That's just less than, greater than, or equal to. Maybe I know something that can give me that. So because we've seen all this syntax, it's open season on using it. There's no more, uh, we're out of the, the phase where we can just get the marks or, or get the answer just by knowing the right syntax. We assume we know everything. It's about how to put all the pieces together.